Praise the Lord. Today I'd like to share with you some things about fasting and about why fasting works, what it will accomplish, how to do it, and things like this that I believe will really benefit us. The very first thing to establish is that fasting is still a valid practice today. There's a lot of people, uh, as I was, that used to think that fasting was something that just you read about in the Bible days, but it wasn't for us. Now, basically, I've never really heard anybody teach against fasting, but the fact that so very few people do it, by precept we teach that it's not for us today. And so there's many people that literally don't understand the importance of fasting because it's not applied to us today. It's always something that we read about that people did in Bible days or in other Eastern religions or something, and very few people really understand that it is for us today. But it is. Now, a few scriptures to verify this. First of all, out of Matthew chapter 6, in verse 16, Jesus was teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, and he said in verse 16, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto man to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Now, Jesus did not say, if you fast, but rather, when you fast. Now, this shows us that it was the design of the Lord Jesus for us to fast. Now, many people would say, well, he was speaking to a specific group of people there. That doesn't apply to us. Well, if that doesn't apply to us, then none of the rest of the sixth chapter of Matthew applies to us. And that talks about prayer. It talks about giving your alms. That talks about seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto us. No, in context, if those other things apply to us, this also applies to us. The Lord was talking about when we fast. It was just supposed that we would continue. It is definitely an established practice in the Old Covenant. There are many, many examples where the entire nation of Israel would fast all at one time for certain things. And there is no reason to believe that it has been suspended under the New Covenant. Another example of this is in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 15. Here the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus and said, Why do the Pharisees and us fast often, but you don't fast, nor your disciples? And in verse 15, well, let me, I, that, I was paraphrasing that, and that's not exactly true. They said, Why don't your disciples fast? Jesus did fast, but his disciples did not. And in verse 15, Jesus saith unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. Now, he's making a, a kind of a parable here to answer their question, and he's comparing himself to the bridegroom and his disciples as the friend. And he says, You don't fast when you've got the bridegroom with you, but when the bridegroom is taken away, then they will fast. So he's saying that when I leave, in other words, after his bodily resurrection and ascension back unto the Father, there would be a time when they fast. Now that is talking about the period of time that you and I live in, and Jesus right here said that during those periods of time, they would fast. Now examples of New Testament believers fasting can be found all the way through the Bible. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27, he, he, when he was given his qualifications as an apostle, he said that he fasted often. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27. And you can see an example of his fasting in uh, Acts chapter 9, where after he had been uh, knocked to the ground by the light and he went into Damascus, he fasted for three days. Also in Acts chapter 27, when he was shipwrecked, he fasted for uh, three days. The men on the ship there had fasted for 14 days because they were in fear of losing their life and they were seeking God, seeking help on it. So anyway, there are many, many examples of New Testament believers fasting. So fasting is a valid practice for us today. Now, let's get, take some examples of people who fasted. Now, there's many, but just some of the main ones that will, uh, you'll relate to and recognize real quickly are uh, Moses. He fasted. He went on an 80-day fast. Now, what he did, actually, after he brought the children of Israel out, he went to Mount Sinai. He went up, first of all, for 40 days and 40 nights, and it says he didn't drink food, I mean, didn't drink water or eat food. 
for 40 days and 40 nights. He came down out of the mountain, had the tables in his hand, and he saw the wickedness of the children of Israel and what they had done. He threw the tables down, broke them, and went immediately back up into the mountain and fasted another 40 days and 40 nights. So actually, he went on an 80-day fast, and he went without food or water. Now, there's some things here that need to be said as we first start talking about fasting. Now, these are just some natural physical truths that you cannot ignore when you fast. Now, some people think that because fasting is a spiritual thing that you can just uh, ignore the physical truth. That cannot be done. Now, there are different types of fast. There is a supernatural type of fast, like what Moses went on, where God supernaturally sustains you. That also happened in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 4 through 8. You'll find an instance there where Elijah was sitting down under a juniper tree, and he was complaining to God about he was the only one left that was serving him. And uh, anyway, he fell asleep. An angel woke Elijah up, and when Elijah woke up, he looked, and there was food spread out before him. This angel had prepared a meal for him, and so the angel told him to eat. And he ate of that food, and then he fell asleep again. And then the angel woke him up again and told him to eat because the journey was too great for him. So he ate again, and this time he ran for three days solid in the strength of that food. He fasted for three days, and he was running that entire time is what the Scripture says. And so that was a supernatural fast. God gave him a food that supernaturally sustained him for three days' worth of running, the first marathon runner recorded in the Bible. Now, that's a supernatural fast. And Moses' fast for going 80 days was supernatural, but that violates natural laws. Like, for instance, the uh, medical profession will tell you that up to 40 days a person can fast without actually starting to die. Now, I know that that sounds contrary to some of us. Some of you probably feel like after a couple of hours that your body is literally starving and that you've got to give it something to eat. But that's not true. The medical profession will even tell you that fasting one day out of seven is healthy for you. It is actually a preventative health measure. Because it will cleanse your body. It will flush uh, poisons and, and corruptions and stuff like that out of you. And many medical doctors even advise people to fast one day out of seven. It is not damaging. You do not starve. It is actually beneficial. Up until 40 days, you literally are not destroying your body. Now, that's a very big statement, and that could vary depending on how you treat yourself during that period of time, how active you are, and a lot of other things. But talking about a person that just separated themselves and was not out physically exerting themselves, uh, you could fast for up to 40 days before you start to die. But anywhere from 40 days on, your body, body is literally eating itself. It's destroying and tearing down the cells, trying to keep energy level up in the body and keep the vital organ functions going. And it'll actually start destroying uh, some of the parts of the body that are not as vital to keep the vital organs going. And so you literally start dying after 40 days. Now, this gives real uh, understanding to why it was such a temptation for Jesus when he was tempted in Luke, the fourth chapter, uh, during the temptation when Satan came to him and asked him to turn those stones into bread because Jesus had been fasting for 40 days. He literally had reached a point where his body was starving, and he had to have some food. And you'll remember after that temptation, the angels came to him and strengthened him supernaturally, or he would not have been able to get down off of that mountain. Now, when Moses fasted, Moses not only went out without food for 40 days, but he also went without water. Now, Jesus may also have done that, but the Bible doesn't just specifically say that he went without water. But Moses, it does say that he didn't eat food or drink water for 40 days. Now, water is even more of a necessity to the physical body than food is. Within three days after going without water, you will literally begin to die. And within seven days, you will die. Uh, uh, you know, on, on an average, the average person will die within seven days without water. And so uh, those are things that need to be taken into account. When I was in Vietnam, I went uh, through a period of time where I was really seeking the Lord about some things. I didn't have very much understanding about fasting. And so I was doing it with some of the wrong attitudes. But anyway, I was fasting over in Vietnam. And for three and a half days, I went without food or water. I thought, see, I didn't know anything about a fast, and I thought that I'd just cut off everything. I wouldn't drink water or anything. 
And as a result, I got so weak and so tired that I'd lay on my cot. And if I'd stand up, I'd get to where I could not keep standing up. I'd pass out. There's a few times. I don't know for sure if I did pass out because I was by myself. But there's a few times that I just lost touch with reality. And uh, I literally had to... <laughs> I was only about probably 10 or 15 yards between the, uh, the bunker where I was staying in and the mess hall. And when I ended that fast, I just had to nearly crawl over to that mess hall because I was so weak. And uh, I didn't understand it. It wasn't the being without food. It was being without water that was a problem. I've gone a lot longer than three days without food, and it never has uh, affected me that way as long as I'm drinking water with it. Now, the reason I'm bringing this out is because there are supernatural fasts that God does call people on on occasions. I believe that they are rare occasions, and now I don't have a scripture to say that they're rare. I just, in my experience and also in looking in scripture and other experiences, I, I just see that they are few and far between. There is a supernatural fast that God can call you on where he miraculously sustains you like Moses. Moses went 40 days. Well, if you put those two back to get back, he went 80 days without food or water. And, of course, after seven days, he would have died without water. So that was nothing but supernatural. And that kind of doesn't fit into any of the molds. You can't sit there and say that you have to uh, conform to this, because if God supernaturally tells you, tells you to do it, and if God supernaturally sustains you, then it's going to work. But that is not the normal. Most of the time, uh, a fast that you go on will be a what I'm calling a natural fast where your body will be affected with hunger. And if you don't drink liquids and if you don't do certain things, your body will be affected. And you can literally kill yourself on a fast. I knew one man that literally killed himself by going on a 47-day fast. Not so much the fact that he went 47 days, but the way that he came off of that fast. We'll be explaining that a little later. You need to have wisdom. Now, some people might think, well, if, you know, a supernatural fast is the only kind of real fast that you ought to go on. Well, if we get in and explain why a fast works and what it will produce, you'll find out that a supernatural fast has benefit. But actually, as far as bringing your body into subjection and gaining control over it, a natural fast where you do experience hun hunger and things like that is actually more productive. So a natural fast is not inferior to a supernatural fast. It is just different, and you need to realize that, and don't presume upon God. Don't sit there and tempt God by abusing your body and going longer than 40 days. Actually, I don't believe that there's much reason to go 40 days. That's uh, very few and far between, I believe, do that. And um, I'm not saying you couldn't. But I'm saying anything over 40 days is really beginning to abuse your body, and you would have to definitely have a word from the Lord to do something like that. Also concerning drinking liquids, you need to have some understanding about that unless you're on a supernatural fast, and you need to know whether God called you on it or whether you chose to do it. Then you need to remember some things about liquids, and you need to be sure and drink a lot of liquids when you're on a fast. Now, I brought all of that up simply to mention that sometimes people get discouraged because they may hear somebody's testimony of somebody who went on a fast that God supernaturally called and God supernaturally sustained them and they were able to work for three weeks and run every day and do all of this and they didn't drink water or eat food and uh, somebody else might try and do that same thing and they'll just fall flat of their face they'll nearly kill themselves and you need to realize that uh, there are different types of fast a natural type of fast is not inferior to a supernatural type of fast it's important that you realize this so that you won't be comparing yourself with somebody else who may have had a supernaturally sustained fast and feel like you're missing it because your fast didn't go in the way that theirs did. Also, it's important that you realize this. I've referred a couple of times to the fact that God calls somebody on a fast. Many people have the mistaken impression that every time you fast, God has to specifically tell you to do it. That is not true. Now, he will do that sometimes because there will be things coming up in the future that you could handle much better if you had fasted and accomplished, you know, the right results through fasting. And so God will specifically sometimes tell you to do that. But basically, the majority of the time, the vast majority of the time, a fast is not something that God calls you on. It's something you choose to do on your own as free will sacrifice unto God. 
as we talk about what a fast will accomplish and how it works, you'll understand much, much more why that's so. But there's a comparison here between giving. Like many times, the Lord will tell a person to give a specific amount of money, and he definitely does that because uh, I've had people give me money, I mean, down to the very last penny of what I had to have. Now, the Lord does that for a number of reasons. He does it because he wants to supply the need to that person. Also, sometimes he'll do it to help verify to that person that it's God that's supernaturally meeting that need. I mean, down to the last penny. There's no way that a physical human being could have known the exact figure of the amount needed. And so the Lord will tell you specifically to give your money here or to give it there. But that is not the basic way of giving. And there are many people who literally do not give properly because they wait on God to tell them every time where to give. Now, again, that's a valid way of giving, but the Bible says out of Second Corinthians chapter 9, it says, Let every man give as he purposeth in his own heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. Now, that shows that there is definitely a time of giving when you are not required to give. God didn't tell you to give, but you just give of your own free will. God wants you to give sometimes just out of love for him. He doesn't want to have to tell you every time that he wants you to give. Love is not truly uh, love unless it is free will. Now, God, because of your obedience and because you want him to tell you, will tell you where to put your money sometimes, but not every time. Many times he'll just want you to give simply as you have been ministered unto by him or through one of his ministers. And so that's a valid way of giving. It's the same thing with fasting. Fasting is, is sometimes called because of a certain reason. Maybe you're going to come up against something that you really need, the extra power that fasting will produce in your life. But you should not always wait on God to call a fast. There are certain times that you declare a fast in your life. There are many examples in the Bible where a king or a priest or somebody would call a fast for an entire nation. And they would meet together and fast. It didn't say God did it. It said people did it. And God honored it. And so you need to realize that. Now, we were talking about the fact that other Bible characters fasted. We mentioned Moses. David fasted in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Elijah fasted. We use that example in 1 Kings chapter 19. Daniel fasted on a number of occasions. One of them is Daniel chapter 10. Jesus fasted. Paul fasted. And uh, something about Jesus fasting, it's important that you realize a lot of people think fasting is just for when you've blown it real bad. That, man, if you're really in a desperate situation, then is when you need to fast. Well, when you're in a desperate situation, that's definitely a good time to fast, and it will accomplish. But Jesus never got in any desperate situations. Jesus didn't fast because he had really blown it or because he was so bad off or because he was wicked. He was none of those things. Jesus was sinless. He was the perfect Son of God, and yet he fasted many, many times. Now, that shows that fasting is not just to get yourself out of a hole. Fasting is also a preventative thing. Fasting is a way of making yourself sensitive to the things of God. And not only sin can harden you towards the things of God, just walking through this world, if you pay attention to it, if you keep your mind stayed on that, that can harden you to the things of God. I personally believe that's the reason Jesus fasted, was because he was walking in a world that nearly every sense knowledge he had was trying to impart carnal knowledge to him, and he had to keep his mind stayed on God, so he'd withdraw and fast. And so it's important to realize that these uh, Jesus himself and these other great men of God uh, used fasting, and so therefore it is a valid thing in our life. You will not find a man of God who is really used who does not use fasting. It is a powerful tool in a person's life. Before we get into exactly what fasting will accomplish, I'd like to say this, that fasting can be misused. Now, I believe it's important to say this because a lot of people think fasting is nothing but going without food. No, it is much, much more than that. And because people have gone at fasting with just thinking it's going without food, they didn't reap the proper benefits of it. And they think, well, boy, there's nothing to that. I don't see that it produced anything in my life. So they quit doing it. Also, it's, it's possible to fast for strife and for debate so that you can use it. And as it says in Matthew chapter 6, talking about fasting in secret, you can fast so that people will see you, so that you can tell people about how spiritual and how holy you are, so that you're actually fasting for your own self.
so that you can get recognition from man. Now, if that's your attitude in fasting, that will be non-productive. In Matthew chapter 6, I'd like to read these scriptures to you. We read one of them a minute ago. But Jesus is teaching on fasting, and he says, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Now, the Lord here is teaching that fasting ought to be something that's between you and God. You ought not to be doing it to gain the acclaim of man. If you do that, you aren't fasting unto God. You're fasting unto man, and you have your reward. In other words, that little pat on the back where they said, Oh, you're so holy. That's all you'll ever get out of that fast. You'll never see the power of God released in your life. It is not going to release the ability of God. All you're going to get is that little pat on the back. He says, But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto man to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And the whole point of what he's saying is you ought to fast not to be getting man's approval, but you ought to fast out of your love for God as a, as a witness, as a love expression unto God to discipline yourself and separate yourself unto God. That ought to be your motive. And he uses the term here, secret. And many people have taken this. I know that there's one man I heard one time that even took this so far. He applied it to prayer. In Matthew chapter 6 right here, he said some of the same things about praying. This man said it was wrong for us to ever pray in public or to let another person hear us pray, that we ought to go into our closet and pray. And he came into a prayer meeting that I was holding with some young people, and he tried to break up that prayer meeting because we were praying together. Now, that is not what he's talking about here. Because there's examples of public prayer. In Acts chapter 4, all of the disciples prayed together and lifted up their voice at the same time. And on and on you could go. There's many examples of public prayer. So this is not talking about the fact that it's wrong to let somebody hear you pray, or it's also not talking about the fact it's wrong to let somebody know you did fast. It's simply saying don't make that the reason you're fasting. I have seen people go to such an extreme with this scripture that if you came up to them and said, are you fasting? They'd say no, because they were trying to keep anybody from knowing about it. Now, that's a lie. And uh, I guarantee you, you aren't going to prosper if you operate in line while you're on your fast. The point he's making is don't make that the emphasis. Don't go around telling everybody that you're fasting. Don't go around looking you know, miserable, so that when everybody asks, what's the matter with you, you can say, oh, I'm fasting. I'm really denying myself. No, that's not what he's saying. He said, don't tell anybody about it. If they ask you, all right. Uh, like on this teaching, I'm sure that I'll probably refer to some time I fasted or done something like that. I'm using that simply as a teaching tool. That is not wrong. I didn't fast. I didn't go on that fast so that I could sit there and get man's approval or acclaim. I did it for a specific reason, but I'll take some of the principles or things I learned out of them and teach people. That is not wrong. But it can be misused. If a person is doing it just for their own pride to build their ego, then you are not going to see fasting produce in a proper way. And so you must uh, realize that and be aware of it. Now I'd like to share with you the reason why fasting works and how it works. As you understand this, then you will be able to um, use it much more effectively. You'll know exactly what to expect, exactly what's going on, what it is accomplishing, and you'll also know how to use it. Uh, a misunderstanding about this has made a lot of people back off from fasting. And so I believe that this will really be beneficial. Out of Matthew chapter 17, I'd like to share this scripture in verse 20. This is the instance where Jesus had uh, been up on the mountain with three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John. And while he was there, he was transfigured before his disciples. While he was up on the mountain, mountain a man came to Jesus with his son, who was a lunatic. And he was demon-possessed. And since Jesus wasn't there, he asked his disciples that had remained down off of the mountain to cast the demon out of him. Now, these disciples had been given a command and the ability in Matthew chapter 10 to cast out devils, and they had done it and had seen results. But this specific demon, they were not able to cast him out. So when the father of this son saw Jesus walking down off of the mountain, he ran to Jesus and asked Jesus to cure his son. He says, I tried to get your disciples to do it, and they couldn't. And so Jesus cast the demon out of this man's son. 
And, of course, the disciples' reaction in Matthew chapter 17, verse 19 was, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus answering said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall be removed, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Jesus told his disciples it was their unbelief that kept them from casting this demon out. He did not say it was their little faith or lack of faith. He said it was their unbelief. You can release faith and have God's faith active, but unbelief, if it is, is present with it, will counteract that faith and stop that faith from producing. That's the reason that Jesus went on to tell his disciples, For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mount, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. What he was saying was, he says, it's your unbelief that stopped it. He's trying to encourage them. He says, you got faith. If you only have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can say unto this mount, Remove hence to yonder place, and it will obey you. It was your unbelief that stopped you. And then in verse 21, he says, How be it this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Now, I do not believe that he was speaking of this kind of demon doesn't come out, but by prayer and fasting, because demons respond to the name of Jesus and faith in his name. That's what casts a demon out, not how much you've been fasting. The devil does not look at your charts and your attendance records or your fasting records to see whether he's going to leave or not. No, he responds to the authority that's in the name of Jesus when it's spoken in faith. This is speaking of that the kind of unbelief that hindered them does not come out but by prayer and fasting. And so we see that prayer and fasting are effective at breaking down unbelief in our life. The result of that will be that when you remove unbelief, just a little tiny faith, even as a grain of mustard seed, will move mountains, raise the dead, provide anything that you need. You see, we do have faith, but we've also got much, much, much too unbelief, too much unbelief. And so we need to deal with that unbelief, and fasting is one way of doing that. Now, why does fasting deal with unbelief? Well, first of all, you've got to know where unbelief comes from. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now, that's talking about when you get born again, that the faith for that salvation comes through hearing the Word of God. You cannot be born again without a preacher. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. Also, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3 establishes that all things that pertain unto life and godliness are given unto us through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. Our faith is linked directly to the knowledge that we have, and not only the knowledge that we have, but what we think upon. You could even have the knowledge of God, but if you don't meditate upon that knowledge of God, you won't gain faith from the knowledge of God. So our faith is linked directly to what we think on. Well, the, the converse of that is true, too. Or in other words, the opposite of that is true. That our unbelief is also linked directly to what we think upon. Now, there's many scriptures, many scriptures that we could go into, just a, a couple. In Romans chapter 8, verse 6, it says, To be carnally minded is death. And death there doesn't only mean physical death, but it means results of sin. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, uh, 23. And right there, it means unbelief is definitely a form of death. It's really what produces physical death in your body. It comes through keeping your mind stayed on carnal things. Carnal does not have to mean sin. All sin is carnal, but not all carnal things are sin. Carnal simply means all the five senses are the natural realm. A person could be a very godly person in the sense that they don't go out and commit adultery, steal, kill, hate children, or do things like that, and yet they could be a very carnal person. There are many examples of good, moral people in the United States who live a very good life, but they are carnal. They don't really dominate themselves with spiritual truths. They just don't get into the wickedness that some people get into, but their life is totally caught up in the normal. When it comes to dealing with healing, they haven't been out living in sin, but they also have not been really meditating on the things of God and keeping their mind stayed upon it, and so they'll relate to sickness because that's what the natural realm is. 
It has thickness in it. They'll relate to the natural thing. They'll re always be dominated by the natural instead of the supernatural. Now, that's carnal. That's how unbelief comes is through what you keep your mind stayed upon. Now, this is the reason that fasting is so important in destroying unbelief because... When take your attention off of the physical realm and put it on the spiritual realm to persist in a fast. When you begin to fast, your physical body will begin to rebel at that because it wants food. Your natural senses, if they have been fed continually on the natural realm, uh, they will begin to rebel when you withdraw from your daily activities. Now, this is something else that needs to really be understood, that a fast, to be effective, you need to withdraw yourself. Now, that's the most productive fast that there is, is when you can separate yourself, like from your job or from a certain situation, and just seclude yourself and put all of your attention on the Lord. In other words, the reason you're really doing without food is because you are spending so much time with your attention stayed upon God that you don't have time to eat. You aren't taking time to do your work. You aren't taking time to do anything else. You are staying all of your attention upon God. Now, that's the best fast that there is. There's abbreviations of that. There's all kinds of fasting that you can do, and you can fast and still go about your daily job. Now, that can still be very productive. Of course, it won't be quite as productive as completely withdrawing yourself, but it's still a valid form of fast, and you can do it, and it will help you. And if you're in a position where you simply can't get loose, I still would uh, practice that type of fast. But anyway, one of, the, one of the main principles of a fast is withdrawing yourself from other things. For instance, a person that says, well, I'm fasting, and all they're doing is going without food, but they're still sitting in front of the TV and watching stuff. I'm talking about even if it's a so-called decent TV show, you are not really fasting because the basic principle of a fast is to put your attention totally upon God, to just turn towards God, withdraw yourself from things. Now, the reason this is so productive, you see, is because Satan comes at us through our physical senses. We are a spirit. Our spirit is the part of us that was born again. It's the part that's changed. It's the part that God inhabits. Now, he lives in our body, but he specifically inhabits our spirit. Our spirit is the part of us that's changed. Our physical body is not changed. Our mental or emotional realm is not changed also. Now, they're subject to change, but they don't automatically change at conversion. The part of us that change is our, changes is our inner man, and that's our spirit. We are supposed to walk in the Spirit, as it says in Galatians chapter 5. We're supposed to follow the leading of the Spirit. In John chapter 4, verse 24, the Bible says, God is a Spirit, and those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. We approach unto God with our spirit, not in our natural man, but through our spirit. That's how we contact and really communicate with God. That's also how God communicates with us. So everything we receive from God comes through our spirit. The wisdom, the knowledge of God, the voice of God, the leadership of God, the healing of God, the prosperity of God, everything comes through our spirit first. We renew our mind to it and learn how to submit our bodies to it. So the spirit should be in control. Now, a person that's having problems in their life, usually it's because Satan has got in somewhere and messed up things, and Satan... Uh, was able to do it because we allowed him to some way. He either got us through our ignorance or through out-and-out -out rebellion, disobedience to God, or through neglect. Lots of times we can just neglect. We can get occupied with things of the natural, and we can lose the battle by default simply because we didn't get in and apply our spiritual weapons. But you see, even though Satan is the author of things, and he is the one that's getting in and fighting against the things of God, it can't really accomplish anything unless somehow or another we submit to it. And the way we submit to it is with our emotional realm. We let the physical dominate us. Like, for instance, 
most people have let their body dictate them. When they uh, say at the end of the day they, they want to spend time studying the Word or praying or fellowshipping with God, but their body's tired and their body says, oh, we're going to sleep. And uh, there is a battle right there. You see, the body is wanting to do one thing. The spiritual man is wanting to do another thing. And there's a conflict going on. Most people have given so much place to their physical body that their body will dominate them. Now, that same body, if it was to sit down in front of a TV set and watch a football game, could get excited, see, and revive. But it will go to rebelling at the things of God. This is what it says in Galatians chapter 5. It says that the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Now, that's not only talking about the physical body, but that's talking about the entire realm outside of the born-again part of us. The soul and the body together lust against the spirit and the spirit against them. In other words, there's a warfare going on. Satan, through your emotions, is trying to entice you and get you to do things contrary to God. Now, I'm not only talking about sin. Now, that does apply to sin, but just natural knowledge. Natural knowledge will also stop the faith of God. Like, let's go back to Matthew chapter 17, where these disciples could not cast out this demon, and it was because of unbelief. It was not unbel Their kind of unbelief was not the kind of unbelief that said, I don't believe God can do it. They did believe it. They had already seen demons cast out. They had already cast out demons. And the very fact that they tried to cast this demon out shows that they knew God had given them power and that they could do it. I honestly believe that the problem was that they saw this boy wallow on the ground and foam. If you read this same uh, example in one of the different Gospels, you'll find, I believe it's in Luke chapter 9, that as the boy was brought to Jesus, that the child fell on the ground and wallowed and foamed at the mouth, and he was screaming. Now, these disciples, see, saw that manifestation. I don't believe that they disbelieved God could do it, but what it was, they had not yet renewed their mind totally to the way they should. They still were dominated more by what they saw than by what they believed. They saw this physical manifestation, and their physical body related more. It was more dominated by what it saw than by what it believed. Now, most people say, well, how could you expect it to be any other way? We can do that. According to Hebrews chapter 5, I believe it's verse 14, it says, Strong meat belongs to those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You can actually bring your senses, your sense knowledge, into a place of submission to where it will come under submission to the Spirit instead of being rebellious towards it. Now, not many people are there, but I believe that you can do it. And that's what these scriptures are teaching. One of the ways you do it is by fasting, because fasting will deny the physical realm. If your natural emotions, if your mind has been dominating you instead of your spirit, if you've been going by your feelings instead of by your spirit, well, then as you start on a fast, all of your feelings are going to rebel at that, because, see, feelings don't like to go without food. That body likes to be pampered. And your natural realm will rebel at what you're doing. It'll throw up red flags. It'll scream and holler and roll on the floor and throw a ball and fit. I mean, it'll just get upset when you go to denying it uh, what it wants. And many people, see, when they see this happening, they back off from a fast. And they say, well, man, I don't know. You know, this isn't what I thought. I thought that if I went on a fast, it was just going to be so glorious, fellowshipping with God and that God would do some special things and... And they back off and say, I'm not having a good time at all. I'm miserable. I'm thinking about food. I'm hungry. And I'm feeling weak. And on and on it goes. And so many people back off. But you see, when that begins to happen, that actually is a godly thing. Because what you're doing, you are making those carnal things surface in your life. You're showing the control that your physical body has been, dominate, uh, has been exerting rather than your spirit. And you're dealing with it and you're doing battle. Now, it may be a battle and it may be a struggle, but you're actually accomplishing something good because you're resisting that thing. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. As you withdraw from obeying the physical lust of your body and you begin to start turning all of your attention towards God, you'll find out that it will submit that body to the control of the spirit. And once you begin to get the proper order where your spirit is controlling and your soul and body are following, then's when the life of God, see, comes flowing through you. That's how the power of God is released. 
Now, see, this is the reason that fasting changes you. Fasting doesn't change God. God isn't more impressed with you after a fast than he is before, but your fasting changes you. It'll break down your carnality. It'll break down the control that your natural senses are having over you, and you'll begin to start walking as a spirit man. And that's where the life of God is. So it changes you. It opens you up more to the flow of the Spirit. Now, we can see a number of examples, like in Daniel chapter 10, also in Acts chapter 27, where Paul fasted. In a number of cases, fasting is directly associated with seeking God for wisdom. Now, the reason for that is, is because God's already given us all wisdom in our spirit. That's out of 1 Corinthians 2.16, 1 John 2.20, 1 John 2.27, Colossians 3.10. Many other scriptures show that we already have the wisdom of God. But because of the hardness of our heart, we may not be perceiving that wisdom. We might be walking in a carnal mind because we've been thinking and dwelling upon carnal things. And so that just simply dominates us and blinds us to this spiritual wisdom of God. One way to deal with that is, as you fast... You turn all of your attention away from the natural realm, and you focus all of your attention on God. Now, you have to do that on a fast, because if you don't, if you continue to think in the natural realm, this is the reason that it's so beneficial when you can totally withdraw yourself from your job and from everything, and just totally separate yourself unto God. It's beneficial because you you have to do that to get your mind off of food, to get your mind off of things that your body is doing without. And as you get your mind off of it, you see, that's how you really bring this body into subjection. And as you get your mind stayed upon God, you'll find out that that wisdom was already there. All you had to do was just really tune it in. Good. Just like if you had a radio here. Sometimes you have to do some fine tuning to get that signal to come in because there's static. There's other things. If you don't have your dial exactly on the station you're trying to hear, other stations will override it and confuse the signal. That's what happens sometimes. The reason we don't get the proper leading of God is because we've been too sensitive to the world. We've been walking in it and listening to it and responding to it more than what we have. God is still speaking, but we simply don't hear him because our attention has been diverted. So we withdraw from the world, focus our attention on God, and fine-tune it. And as we do, the Lord, see, he was speaking the whole time, but now we're able to hear him. And we pick up on it, and we begin to operate accordingly. Now, that basically is why a fast is so important. That's why it'll break unbelief, because unbelief has to be fed. Unbelief must be fed just like faith has to be fed. You have to continually meditate on the Word of God to operate in faith. You have to meditate on the things of the devil to operate in doubt and unbelief. And it's a good discipline for us to withdraw ourselves from doubt and unbelief. Now, all of us have sinned. We've got doubt and unbelief in us that we've got to root out. But even Jesus, who was sinless, fasted, and I believe that this is one of the reasons that he did it, was because although he had no sin, there was continual sin around about him. There was continual negative things. His natural senses could relate to the physical things that he saw. And if he had not lived a separated life to where he continually kept withdrawing from that situation and putting his attention back on God, he could have got caught up in that natural realm. It could have enticed him and drawn him into that realm of sin. Again, go back to the example where Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Satan came at him with a temptation and used his physical realm to try and draw him into that sin. He took his desire for food and tried to tempt him with it. Now, Jesus overcame it and said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But it shows how Satan uses the physical body to tempt us. And so we must bring it under subjection. Paul talked about this. He talked about dying to himself, reckoning himself to be dead. He talked about mortifying the deeds of the flesh, bringing his body under subjection and keeping it there, buffeting his body so that he would not be a castaway when he had preached to other people. In other words, he realized that if he overindulged his body, then and if he didn't gain control over it, Satan could have an inroad to him through his body. So he disciplined it. And he ruled his body instead of his body ruling him. This is the reason many people don't receive healing, is because they are so prone to respond to their body. Their body is the one that has dominated them for so long that when the Word comes along and says, By his straps we are healed, the Word says that, but your body says, No, I hurt. And they simply have learned to respond to their body more than they have to the Spirit. 
We can break that by fasting and saying, Body, you are not going to rule me. I'll rule you. You can yell and scream and holler and do anything you want, and I am not going to feed you until the appointed time, and you are going to come under the control of the Spirit. Every time you do that, you will strengthen the dominance of your spirit man and weaken the dominance of your physical man. That will benefit us in every area of our life. Another benefit of a fast is just the simple fact that most people are literally overweight. It comes from the fact that they exercise too little and eat too much or eat the wrong kinds of food. That is an undisciplined life that will hurt you physically, but even emotionally, uh, going back to the same things we're saying, it is a detriment to us because we are letting our body dominate us. You need to fast sometimes just to gain control of your body, and it would really benefit you, and of course it will pay spiritual dividends. So that is really the purpose of a fast. The basic underlying thing in a fast is... are denying your body the right to control you. As you do that, then you limit Satan's access to you because Satan tempts you through the desires and the lust of your body. You will not be going by your feelings, but instead you'll be going by faith. And as you do that, then you are strengthening the control of the Spirit in your life and you're hindering Satan's control. And so that's the reason fasting is so important. And praise God, we need to be using it much, much more than what we are. I want to read these scriptures out of Isaiah chapter 58. This is talking about a fast. And in verse 3, the scripture says, Wherefore have we fasted? Now, these are people speaking to God. And these people are people who had rebelled at God. And uh, they were being afflicted. Their country was being overrun. And they were blaming God for it. And here's what they said. They said, Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure, and exact all of your labors. Now they asked the question, why are we fasting and it's not producing anything? Here's the Lord's answer. Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure, and exact all of your labors. In other words, the Lord is showing you here that a fast is so that you can withdraw yourself from your normal routines and, and focus all of your attention upon God. It's not a day for you to go out and be goofing around and doing this and still doing all of your labors. Now, again, I say that that can be modified, and uh, you can fast in all different kinds of ways. You don't have to go on a total food fast. You can just fast certain types of food. You could go on eating nothing but salads, as Daniel did in the first chapter of Daniel. They refused to eat meat, and they ate only certain kinds of food. That's a fast. You can fast your time. You can begin to just take a certain amount of time that you would normally do something else and fast under the Lord. There's all kinds of modifications to fast. You can fast in many different ways, but the ideal way is to withdraw yourself from your labors and to withdraw yourself from going out and doing something that's just, you know, a pleasure thing where you're uh, just occupying time, and you separate yourself totally unto the Lord. An example of this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where Paul was talking about the husband and wife relationship, and he said, defraud not one another. And he was talking about the physical relationship. In other words, don't you uh, withhold the physical relationship in marriage except with consent for a season that you may give yourselves to fasting and to prayer and that you come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So that right there shows that on a fast it would be proper for a husband or wife to even separate themselves maybe for a day or so and go somewhere and just do nothing but spend time with God. Now, again, I'm not saying that's the way it has to be, but I'm saying that that can be beneficial. And he says here, Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day, to make your voice to be heard on high. And this applies to what we talked about earlier, that there are right and wrong ways to fast. You could meditate on this and get much more instruction out of it. 
Verse 5 says, it, Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush, and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Now, the Lord's answer, answering a, asking a question. And uh, it doesn't make it exactly clear to me how he's saying this, but I believe that the answer to these questions would be, No, this is not the acceptable fast. In verse 6, he begins to say, Is not this the fast that I've chosen? In other words, he's contrasting the two. He says, Is this the way I want you to fast? Is this how it's supposed to be? He says, Isn't it rather like this? Is not this the fast that I've chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? Now, those scriptures right there say that uh, the fast will loose the bands of wickedness. It will undo the heavy burdens, let the oppressed go free. It will break every yoke. On a fast, we ought to give to somebody else. Feed them. Now, that's a way of denying yourself. Give somebody else the very thing that your body is craving for. The same thing could be applied to healing. If you need healing, go out and give healing to somebody else. And uh, on and on. In verse 8 it says, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re-reward. It says, Then shall thy light break forth. In other words, after the fast, then your light will bring forth. This is another thing that's a problem to many people. They want to see results on the fast at that exact moment. And many times you don't see results during the fast, it'll be when the fast is over, after you've brought yourself into subjection, after you've gone back to eating, and after you've gone back to some of your normal things, then revelation will come. Then healing will spring forth. It's uh, kind of dangerous to put a time element on certain things and say, I'm going to fast until this happens, because it's many times then, after the fast, your healing springs forth. Now, there's much, much more that could be said about that. I'm running short on time. But I do simply want to emphasize that that is the basic underlying reason for a fast is to gain dominion over your physical body and over your soulish realm, to let your spirit dominate instead of letting the flesh realm dominate. Now, that is beneficial in every area of the Christian life. The last thing I'd like to deal with is that there are some natural things involved in fasting. The Bible says, if you sow to the flesh, you'll of the flesh reap corruption. Jesus also told Satan, when Satan tempted him uh, in Luke, the fourth chapter, he says, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. Satan tempted him with the scripture. He says, cast yourself down off this pinnacle of the temple, because the angels will bear you up in their hands. But you see, what he missed was, you don't just go throwing yourself off that temple. Now, if you fell off, God would protect you from Psalms chapter 91. But you don't do it intentionally, tempting God. You don't go drink poison to see if Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18 will work. But if you drink poison, then it won't harm you if you're standing in faith on that scripture. You see, that could be tempting God. You don't do things like that. Well, again... You, on a fast, don't just ignore physical laws. Now, if God called you on a supernatural fast, that's separate. But if you are fasting just on a normal type of fast, you don't ignore physical laws. You've got to learn a few things about your body. I would encourage you to find some books or some kind of material about fasting if you're talking about going on a prolonged fast, anything over like 10 days. And if you're talking about going on a, on a long fast, you ought to find out some physical things so that you will not abuse your body and give place to the devil by abusing your body. You can sow to the flesh, and you can kill yourself on a fast. Again, I say I've seen a man do that. He went on a 47-day fast, and when he came off of it, he just thought, well, I don't have to, you know, uh, come back to eating food gradually again. I'm just supernatural. He felt really strengthened, see, after his fast, and so he was just going to go back to eating normal. And within the week after he was off of that fast, he ate steak and potatoes. And as a result, his body rebelled at that. He got big old bubbles that were on his chest. And if he could belch, then all of the uh, gas would leave. He'd have these bubbles come up on his side and in his back. He got to where he didn't sleep. Anyway, he wound up dying. And I'm convinced it was that fast 
that killed him and because of the way that he came off of it. That is not a proper way to fast. Now, I would suggest that you get some books. I don't want to specifically endorse any particular books. Uh, a book that I read a long time ago, I'm not even sure of all of the content matter of it, but I remember this one thing, that it did have some doctor's instruction uh, and medical um, ideas on fasting and how long you could fast and things like this. And that's author Wallace. He wrote a book. Wallace is spelled W-A-L-L-I-S. And he wrote the book entitled God's Chosen Fast. And some of the medical things that were in there was, uh, as a rule of thumb, just a general rule, if you go on a prolonged fast, anything over, say, like a week, maybe 10 days, uh, if you go over that, then if you fast like 40 days, it ought to take you 40 days after your fast, an extra 40 days, to get back up to eating normally, eating like you did before the fast. So actually, if you go on a 40-day fast, there will be an 80-day period before you go back to eating normally. And as you start off of that fast, after something like a 40-day fast, and of course this would be uh, graduated depending on how long your fast was, but let's take the example of a 40-day fast. If you went that long, then you would not even be able to eat fruit juice uh, straight, you would have to dilute it or your body would rebel at that because it simply is not able to process that food like that. It goes back similar to like a baby. A baby has to uh, grow and develop into eating that kind of food. Well, somehow or another on a fast, your body reacts that way and it simply cannot take straight food. It can't even take straight orange juice. You have to dilute orange juice after a 40-day fast and start back on that gradually. I really think that just common sense in most of this would prevail and would keep you from doing damage to your body. But to make sure, I believe that it would be beneficial for you to get some definite knowledge if you go on a fast any longer than, say, two weeks. Now, I've been on up to a 12-day fast, and uh, during that period of time, I uh, drank water. And uh, sometimes people will drink other things. You can go on a fast and drink uh, all kinds of liquids. And sometimes people just do that as a fast. But I went on a fast where I was off all food, but I was drinking water. And on that fast, I did just fine. There wasn't any problems. And when I came off of it, I just gradually, say, up until about a week after that, I started eating food normally. And I was all right, and it worked out all right. But again, I emphasize that if you're going to go on a fast any longer than that, I've had experience with a fast up to, say, 12 days, but anything longer than that, I would get specific instructions so that you would know what you're doing because you can abuse your body, and unless it's a supernatural fast, you can kill yourself on that fast, and that is not right. You will die without food, and so you can't just fast the rest of your life. You need to use some wisdom in that. Anyway, there's much more that probably could be shared about that, but I believe that that's the basics. If you just take these things and meditate on it and begin to apply it in your life as you fast, then I believe it will really benefit you. I believe that it will help you, and that, praise God, the results is going to be that you're going to gain dominance over your physical body, that you will break the hold of doubt and unbelief if you will live a fasted life. We hope that your heart has been quickened by hearing the Word of God through this message. Remember, Andrew Womack Ministries operates a helpline that you can call for prayer and information at 719-635-1111. We have a ministry website at www.awmi.net and you can write the ministry at P.O. Box 3333, Colorado Springs 80934 Until next time we pray that you will reach out by faith and receive everything that is yours through God's grace